Are we rolling? Are we rolling? Are we rolling? Are we rolling? This is my life. I'm Mark Kelly and this is my life. This is my life, this is my life. I'm Mark Kelly and this is my life. Grew up on the south side of Chicago, born in 1967. And um, my eyes have seen a lot of things coming up in the hood. Jeffrey Manners, Argyle Gardens, 63rd and Michigan, all oh, the south side wasn't no punk. Man, I tell you, I've seen a lot of junk, you know, coming up, you know. Um, been through a lot. Of, my mom, my family, though we had not much of anything, we had family, we had us, we had love. And I, I believe, um, no, I know that that's what got us through, you know. Um, that's what landed me here. Um, I fell from the sky. Landed on the ground. All I know is, man, you know, <clears throat> I was like a sea. I was like a fish in the middle of an ocean. And then I woke up as a well in the middle of a pond. That's how it went down for me, man. I blinked my eyes and next thing you know, I was in the midst of success, in the midst of drama, in the midst of rumors, in the midst of love, but in the midst of haters. But somehow my gift, which was my music, <sighs> um, my depth of struggle was fed into my gift and somehow my gift um, ignited uh, to the point where I was able to communicate with the world and ask the world to rescue me. And the minute I opened my mouth and started to sing, oh, that changed everything. Nowhere, nowhere. I mean, I walked through the drug dealers, I walked through the pimps and the hoes and the hustlers through the hood. The drugs was offered to me. I've been shot, I've been stabbed. But I still, to this day, made it free. Out of the slums, out of the alleys, out of the the deep, 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 dark hood. Sometimes I don't know. Sometimes I don't know just how I got here, just how I made it, just how I made it, just how I made it here. But I'm glad I did. I I'm glad I did. All I ever wanted to do was music, you know. Ever since I was eight years old, I could remember um, having a dream about being 20-something. And in that dream, I remember playing the piano, a white piano, hearing a melody. And the melody at eight years old in my dream where I was 20 went, and here 20 years later, 25 years later, I grow up, I become famous, and I'm sitting at a house where I bought my first piano, which was a white piano, and I begin to play a song. 
began to start writing on a song. And that same melody when I was eight came to me. And I couldn't figure out where I heard this melody from. At first I thought I was like still in this melody, but I come to realize that as the lyrics came to me, I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. I think about it every night and day. Spread my wings and fly away. Tear comes down my eye because I say, wow. I wrote this song when I was eight. But coming up in the hood, I saw so many things. But those so many things brought me all of my dreams. And now here I am, here I am today. Here I am, here I am today. I want to say I'm proud of my past. Um, but more than I am proud, I'm more thankful. Because people ask me all the time, if you can go back in the past, what would you change? I say, I wouldn't change a thing. They say, what? All you've been through, you wouldn't change nothing? I say, no. They say, why? I say, why should I? Look at me. I'm strong. I'm wise. I'm appreciative. I don't take nothing for granted. My past shaped and molded me into who I am today. I think struggle is the best thing if you know how to deal with it, if you know how to overcome, if you know how to deal with your problems. Because if you know how to deal with your problems, and depending on how you deal with your problems, that will become the measure. That will become the measure, the measure of your worth. But you have to know how to deal with it. Anything that happened to me in my past, anything I've been through in my past, I look back behind me and I say, this is where God brought me from. The best gift in life is breathing in and out. So I'm very thankful if I had nothing, if I never sold one record. I was always taught how to be thankful for the gift of breathing in and out. As long as you can breathe in and out, you can make it. Ooh, you can make it. You can make it. You can make you, you, you can make it. Uh, you can make it. As long as you breathe in, long as you're alive, you can make it. You know, I always used to sing in the shower because I was too shy to sing anywhere else. So I was singing in the shower. I thought I sounded good, but, you know, um, my sister would always bam on the door and tell me to stop calling hogs, get out of the bathroom because she had to get in there. I looked at that like she was jealous and you know, just wanted to get in the bathroom and wanted me to get out so she can be in there 20 times as long as, I'm, as I was in there. So I thought I sounded pretty good. The shower gave me an echo, a reverb, a reverb that allowed me to hear myself so beautifully, so clearly, that it gave me the confidence to walk out of the shower eventually and sing throughout the house. Of course, the house did not have the same reverb. Outside did not have the same reverb. But when I dropped out of high school and became a street performer, I was trying to find that reverb that could echo my voice, that could echo 
my life so the world could hear the gift that I had in me. And people ask me to this day, what do you think about your success? How does it feel to perform in front of 100,000 people holding up candles where it looks like a sea of fire? I say, all of that's good and all, and I appreciate that, and I'm very thankful for being able to touch so many people with my music, with my songs. But I tell you, somehow I got that same feeling when I was a street performer down in the subways of Chicago. Yeah, that's right. I was a street performer. 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 And I, and I will always be first a street performer because that allowed me to develop my craft, develop my gift. And besides, it's a great echo down there as well. It was a great echo down there, except for the L coming by. But when the L would come by, I would try to challenge that L and sing louder than the L, and the L would roar. And I would try to sing louder and louder and louder and louder. But the air would be going by. And I would get frustrated because I'm going to get my money if these people don't hear me singing, man. I wanted to tell people, what made y'all put an L here? Well, I'm trying to sing. But then I come to realize that, hey, sometimes you have to rise above the noise, find a way to rise above the noise, Rob. And I tried to rise above the L, still wouldn't work. So I became real slick. I would be singing like this. Someday the world would know my name. And I would be singing like this. Someday the world would know my name. And here comes the L, and here comes the L, and here comes the L, and I'd shut up until the L stopped. And when the L stopped, it became quiet again. And I would say, I know someday the world would know robbers. Robert's name. And the people would clap. Oh, I said, that is. I got to wait till the L stop. That allowed me to develop my patience. Once I developed my patience, I come to find that I had learned how to sing with strength because before I learned how to develop my patience, I actually learned how to sing loud, trying to sing over the L, which gave me strength in my voice, which gave me the ability to be able to ring out like a bell when I sing. It also allowed me to connect with people because I would be singing my songs that I wrote, but I didn't feel there was a connection. The only time I felt the connection is when I started noticing people were coming down from work to catch the L and they had McDonald's bags in their hands. And I was like, uh, oh, McDonald's. If I write a McDonald's song while these people are holding McDonald's bags in their hands, I'm gonna connect because they're gonna laugh and they're gonna say, I can't believe this guy's down here with a piano and a chitlin bucket singing a McDonald's song and I just came from McDonald's. They're gonna feel like I'm talking directly to them, and that's going to make the connection. So that's what I did. I went home, I said, Mom, I gotta write a, a McDonald's song. She said, well, you love McDonald's, you ought to be able to write a McDonald's song, that's your favorite restaurant. I said, that's what I'm gonna do. So I went in the room and I started messing with my little keyboard, Casio that is, and I said, -dum -dum. 
McDonald's is the place for you. When your day is through, you can go to McDonald's and get yourself a Big Mac, a Big Mac. Order of fries, icy Coke with apple pie. No one does it like McDonald's. Do McDonald's and you. And the people would clap. And they would go in their pockets. Oh, I got to pay this guy. This guy's too good. Oh, man, I got McDonald's in my hand. And he's singing McDonald's. Oh, no, he got to get paid. So people started pulling out 50s. I went from making maybe $10 a day, from being there from nine to five, to making four to $500 a day because I made the connection. Now that I know how to make the connection, I took it to the next level. I hitchhiked all the way to LA, even on a motorcycle. Yeah, man, back of some guy's motorcycle. Um, 18-wheeler truck, um, broken down van, got me to L.A. where I lived on Venice Beach for like six months. I'm talking about the sand part. Yeah, I lived on the sand part of Venice Beach. There was a bleacher and there was a basketball court. And I would sleep under the beach bleacher and I would wake up and I would play basketball with the guys that played basketball. Oh, and I would be killing them. They'd be like, where did this guy come from? <laughs> He's here every morning playing basketball with us. And uh, it was interesting because I would play basketball and then I would go and I would street perform with this guy that skates with the good top on Venice Beach, yeah. And um, it was amazing times because those were the times when I was paying my dues. That's right, I was paying my dues. That's right, I was paying my dues, my dues. And sometimes you have to do that. You have to pay your dues. You cannot just wake up and be successful. There's no real success without testimony. The depth of your testimony determines the height of your success. It's not where you are today. It's not how successful you are today. It's what did you do? Where did you go? What did you go through? Where have you been to, to get to this point? That's the engine. I learned a long time ago, after performing on Venice Beach, after being a street performer in Chicago, I went to every talent show, you know, trying to um, win, but I lose all the time, especially in LA, because at this time, LA was a, um, you know, place of image. You had to look to par, not just sound good. And all I had was basketball gear. And I would do really good in the talent shows, but my image, I looked like a, a hooper uh, because I was at the time. So I'd lose. Um, but don't, don't feel for me because see, losing is only uh, temporary. You know, losing, I looked at as a rehearsal. We all lose in rehearsal all the time, over and over and over and over again until we get it right. And that's the point of rehearsal. You rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and rehearse. You mess up, you mess up, you mess up, mess up until you get it right. But LA, street performing, the doors being closed, the nose and all of those things, um, that was my meal ticket, somehow. And I decided then, I didn't want to be stars in the sky. Because though they amazed us as kids, you know, but they sat there. They just sat there. And they sparked. 
But what amazed me and what I've always wanted to study and always wanted to become, and I decided in my mind, and I told my mom, I said, Mama, I'm going to be a shooting star. She said, what you mean, boy? I say, I don't really know what I mean, but I know one thing. I love the shooting star. Why would you love a shooting star? You don't get to see it much. I said, I know. It comes, it goes. You're lucky if you even see one. I said, I know. And it's not like the other stars. I said, I know. But that's the point. If I'm going to be a star, I want to be a shooting star. I don't want to be seen all the time. That's not what I'm about. I'm not about just sitting around in the sky. I want to soar through the sky. In and out of space. People would tell me, well, you could do that, you know, sky's the limit. I say, no, it's not. I would always have my different sayings. I would say space is the limit. Because if you can make it to space, you can travel anywhere. And my brain and my mind, I mean, you know, it, it just always wanted to go places no man has gone, so to speak. You know, I always wanted to be a scientist of music, not just music. I wanted to experiment with my music. I wanted to do um, R&B, but I also wanted to do the world's greatest. You know, but at the time, I was told, no, you stay in this lane, R&B artist, you're going to do the artist thing, you're an artist, R&B king, and this, that, and the other. I was never interested in being an R&B king. People put that label on me, and I appreciate anybody for saying that I'm the best at something, but I never wanted to be the best at one thing. I never wanted to be the best at R&B. I just wanted to be great at music. So I decided to do I Believe I Can Fly. I decided to go on and do um, the world's greatest. I decided to do country songs, pop songs. Uh, you know, You Are Not Alone for Michael Jackson because I, I, I never wanted to be trapped in a category. And somebody said, oh, that's the R&B king. I wanted to be known for just music. That's Mr. Music. That's, he has no lane. The highway, the streets is his, if he wanted it to be. But I came up in Chicago, and the minute I was born is the minute my father left my mother. Yes, the minute I was born is the minute my father left my mother. And I used to ask my mother, where is, where is my father? And every time she shunned the question, she pushed me away. She said, never ask me that again. Son, never ask me that again. But it was hard because I would always see, you know, my brothers, you know, a father would come by every now and then and, you know, take them out, buy them things. And Christmas, Thanksgiving, Easter, you know, Halloween. And I wasn't jealous of my brothers, but I would always, you know, become curious and frustrated because, you know, wanting a father, uh, not having a father, first of all, it's automatically something missing in your life. You know, there's no doubt about that. It's, it's you know, I always felt half. I always felt um, a hole in the situation. Though my mother was a mother, father, brother, sister, best friend, and everything to me, um, she never was really a, uh, a father. My sister father would come by every now and then, but I never understood why my father was not with you know, my mother. That was just a something as a child I didn't understand. And it would hurt so damn bad. It would hurt so damn bad. And me being eight years old, I would be so damn sad. But as I got older, as I got old, I 
became closer to my mom. Me and my mom would go to McDonald's and before she'd go to work, before I'd go to school, and she would get us a Danish, because all we could afford is a Danish and a cup of coffee, but, and we would split the Danish and cup of coffee. She wore this cheap lipstick, and she would uh, put three creams and six sugars in the coffee, and uh, she would stir it up. She would open the Danish, split it with a little plastic white knife, she had this cheap lipstick, and she would taste the coffee to make sure it was uh, sweet enough. And she'd leave the ring of lipstick on the coffee in which she tasted the coffee. And I remember when she would give me mine, when I would sip from the cup, I would turn it around, and I would drink from her lipstick part. Because... In a son mother way, I had a serious, serious crush on my mom because she could sing her butt off. And uh, I just looked up and down to her. I looked around. I looked everything about my mother. You know, I loved her. And I even asked her to marry me one day. I was like, nah. She said no. But you know what? I understood. I understood it. Uh, I took it well. And so when my mom passed, I was coming from my first concert from overseas, in which I wanted her to go with me because that was the only way I was gonna get on the plane. <sighs> so when I got back from overseas, and my mom passed the day I got back, three weeks later, I went away, she was heavy set, she was my mom. I come back, she was very, 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 very skinny. I had no idea she had cancer. I had no idea she was even sick. I went straight to Roseland Hospital on 111th in Chicago. And my sister and brother, I remember them to this day. I said, Mom's very sick. You might not want to go in there, Rob. Of course, you're thinking cold, you're thinking pneumonia, you're thinking she's going to be okay. So I go in the room, I peek my head in, I see the pastor with my mother, I see the doctors. And the first thing my mom said is, she screamed, get out of Robert, I don't want you to see me like this. Get out of Robert, I don't want you to see me like this. All I can say is I'm sorry, Mom. I'm so sorry. I didn't know what else to say. Didn't even look like my mother, but I knew it's my mother. I walked up to her bed, sat, and I asked the doctor who the pastor to excuse us. Even my brothers and them, they excused us. It was me and my mom. She said, please leave. Please. I said, mama, please don't make me leave. Something I gotta tell you. I said, first of all, I love you and I thank you for everything you have done Everything, everything you've done for me, Mom. And I'm sorry for every time I've been bad or did something I wasn't supposed to do. And I promise you, and she died right there on the I promise you. Called the doctor. They came in. They pronounced her dead. I was still holding her hand. But I finished my sentence. I said, I promise you, Mama, no matter what, by any means necessary, I will be the, one of the best singers, songwriters. This world has ever Scene. I 
I made my mom that promise. And um, I'm still on a journey today to fulfill that promise in which I will perform and sing and write like one of the best who has ever done it. I owe it to my mom. I owe it to my gift more than anything now. I owe it to my fans. Just to be one of the best. Not the best, but one of the best. Who has ever done it. It's going to be a little turbulence. But my teacher, mentor, pastor, and I like to call her my Mrs. Minyagi, my music teacher, Lena McLean, she said, do not write songs. Write life. Sex is life. So don't judge me. Don't be mad at me if I make a gospel album. That's life. Don't go getting hating and spreading rumors on me because I made a club banger that says, you may be used to me spending and all that sweet whining and dining while I'm fucking you tonight. Nah, don't judge me. Because I don't judge nobody when I go and see a good movie and somebody get their head blown off. I just enjoy the movie and I appreciate the movie. I appreciate the writing. I appreciate how they told the story. I appreciate, I don't get into, oh man, they got all these guns and they shooting kids and they shooting these people. So don't get mad at me if I write a song, say you remind me of my Jeep. It's just metaphors, it's just entertainment. It's the gift, no different than Bruce Lee. It's a gift. Bruce Lee was Ali. Ali was Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan was Superman. Superman was Spider-Man, and Spider-Man was Batman. Batman was Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King was Moses. There are certain people, certain images that come to entertain us, to take us through history and all through genres and decades and years and years of struggle, but inspiring us to be successful at the same time. That's all I want to be. Don't hit me. I'm an artist, people. And artists are going to go through depths. Chosen artists. I decided not to climb the mountain first. I decided to learn how to hold my balance. That's the struggle. Once I struggle and learn how to hold my balance, then I can start my climb. Because why? The mountain is a peak at the top. Where it's very windy. You can get blown off just like that. That's why I decided to hold my balance, learn to hold my balance first. Because I don't want to stop my climb. And get up there and the easiest thing, blow me off. I want to be able to hold my balance and hold my balance strong. I want to be able to stand at the top of that mountain and say, I'm not coming down until I feel like it. I earned that right. Because I worked my ass off trying to hold my balance. Yeah, that's right. I'm proud of me. I don't have pride. I'm just proud of me. 
And I suggest, no, I urge you to do the same, to think the same, feel the same, be the same. Learn how to hold your balance before you start climbing that mountain because that's how one hit wonders happen. Everybody's so anxious to climb the mountain and knock other people down trying to get there. And when they get to the top, they start developing a pride and an ego. And out of nowhere, whatever happened to us, what's that guy name? He was out, he had that one song. He didn't learn how to hold his balance before he started his climb. That's why I'm still here. <clears throat> That's why I'm still in the game. Because to me, it is not a game. People say this, people say that. They talk about me behind my back. They talk about me in front of my face. They talk about me at the side. I can hear the whispers. I can see the gestures. I can feel the spirit of negativity all around me. People steal my watches. They steal my, 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 my cars. They steal my gold. They steal everything from me. They take my money. Mm. But I wouldn't change a thing. Because I'm not in it for money. I'm not in it for watches. I'm not in it for jewelry. I'm not in it for women. I'm not in it for cars and clothes and houses. And this is just something I was born to do. And I will be doing it until Jesus come back. I love music. I'm pregnant by it. I'm having aplets. Yeah. I'm gonna love my babies. I'm gonna raise them. I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna burp them. They're gonna poop. All those things. Out melodies. Born in the ghetto. Riding my bike, 14 years old. My mom said, You can go two blocks and come back. I said, Okay, mama. Two blocks and back. Okay, mama, two blocks and back. I promise two blocks and back. And then I get on my little huffy. And I do like this because I used to do this because I used to want to think it was a motorcycle. And I say, brum, 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 brum. And I start paddling my bike. Thought I was the coolest guy in the world. Pow! I heard a gunshot. I looked to my right, I looked to my left, I looked behind me. I didn't know what happened. And out of nowhere, I started feeling woozy. I got really dizzy. I started feeling myself. And then I felt, and I did this, and my hand was full of blood. And I looked, my arm was swole up so big, like a kneecap was on my arm right here. And I fell and hit the ground off my bike. And I remember opening my eyes just a little bit I saw all of these guys running towards me. And I said to myself, thank you, help, help. But actually it was the guys that shot me. They were taking my bike. And I laid there. I can hear people screaming. I can hear people coming. Next thing you know, I remember waking up in the hospital and I remember the doctor telling my mother that they couldn't move the bullet out of my arm. It's gonna grow a tissue around it because it's too close to a nerve. And if they touch that nerve, it could paralyze my whole arm. Or the right side of my body. Oh, 
Don't y'all touch me. <laughs> I have a career. Yeah, I know I'm 14, 13, but I'm, I'm going to be somebody. And I can't do that being paralyzed. I said, Mama, please don't let them cut me, Mama. She said, don't worry about it, baby. They're not going to touch you. It's going to be all right. You're going to be all right. At the time, I really loved basketball. I thought I'd never shoot the ball again. But I developed a shot. It was funny because of the bullet was in my arm. And every time I shoot a ball or lift my arm, I feel that bullet. That bullet, I decided, was going to be the constant reminder of the terrible luck I had coming up as a kid, or it was going to be a wonderful reminder of how lucky and how blessed I am to be here today. And of course I chose the second one. Are you kidding me? Look at me. Look what I've been through. Look, look how many people I believe I can fly has been able to touch from here to Africa and everywhere around the world. Kids graduating to it. People feeling like they can walk out of the hospital and they feel better. They don't even have to know who wrote the song. It's people that love the song and don't even identify me with the song. I'm good with that. Because that song was not about me. That song was a seed planted in the earth for people to grow and blossom and go on and live their dreams like I've been blessed and able to do mine. Coming up in the hood, my mother and my stepfather fought like cats and dogs. I hated it, but somehow, the love she had for him, I, I chose to love him too. Well, my brothers know a whole nother story. My sister, they hated him. I found a way to love him because my mom loved him. Coming up in the hood, I don't even know how I got here. I don't, I don't even know. I don't know what these cameras are about. I don't, I don't know magazines and photo shoots and videos and award shows and Grammys and it's all still so surreal to me because my past is so strongly embedded in my head and it's, I don't know how I looked past all of that and made it to where I am today, but I'm thankful that I did. I'm thankful because I want somebody else out there to say, wow, he did it, I can do it. All you have to do is believe. All you have to do is have faith. All you have to do is see what it is you want and become very stubborn and become very determined. Nobody, but nobody's gonna tell you that success ain't mine, that basketball, scholarship, that, that, that trophy, that championship game, that ring, that football touchdown, that isn't mine. And now that I got the ball right, life passed me the ball. I got it, I caught it, I'm running. If I stop, I'm gonna get tackled by a whole lot of people. So I stay running. Stay running. From now on, I'm gonna be on the bright side of things. No more, I can't do it. It's my life, I'm gonna live it. And maybe, 
maybe I'll succeed. What a wonderful thing to get about this hood would be. And maybe, maybe times will change. And someday the world, they would know Robert's name.